Hello and welcome to today's edition of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies. And today we're going to be doing a Patreon request. Eric Wilson would like us to do 1936's Dracula's Daughter, the first ever sequel to the original 1931 Dracula. But before we get started, what are we drinking today? Uh, very fittingly, we're drinking Carfax Abbey Ale. Mmm. <laughs> Dracula's Daughter was directed by uh, Lambert Hillier. He did tons of shit since uh, going back all the way to, what, 1917 or whatever? Yeah. So he was one of the pioneers, basically, of film. And one of the things he's notable for is doing uh, some of the first screen depictions of Batman in those 1940 serials. Oh, those are bad. <laughs> Batman's costume is all shitty and everything. <laughs> they don't even have a Batmobile, it's just a car. <laughs> They're all on some low budget. Yeah. This movie stars Gloria Holden as Dracula's daughter. Hmm. And actually, funny enough, she didn't even want to do the role because she thought she would be typecast as like a horror movie actor, just like Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff were. But no, she wasn't. She pretty much did anything but horror after this movie. Yeah. Edward Van Sloan is in this, and he is in all those original Universal movies. He's in the original Dracula, he's in the original Frankenstein, he's in the original Mummy, mm. and again, his filmography goes way back to like the silent era too. And Otto Kruger is in this. That's the only person I know that has got the actually Kruger, Kruger for a last name. <laughs> no relation to Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> Dracula's daughter starts off directly after the ending of the original movie. A minute later. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> like right after. There's two cops and they're winding down a staircase and they come upon a body and it turns out to be Renfield who's dead. They also see a body that has a stake in it. There's an old man. I did this. He just it comes out and admits it. And it turns out that it's Dracula's body with a stake in it. Of course, well, he killed him, right? Yeah. They haul this Von Helsing back to the station and he admits everything. And he also tells them his story, right? His fantastical yeah. story. Nobody believes him, of course. They think he's a fucking crackpot. And they end up taking the two bodies back. Something in the in the cells, like, ah, oh, there's never been a rat in this cell before. Yeah. And you could see all this, something <laughs> moving, like, under the soil. Like, oh well, yeah, what's in there? This woman comes in. Can I see the bodies? Like, no, you can't. Shows him this ring and it hypnotizes him and puts him in this big trance. It then cuts to a scene where there's this big bonfire there's this woman doing this this like ritual and chanting this is Dracula's daughter putting him to final rest in the hopes that by doing this she will be relieved of these urges that she's been getting to kill and to drink blood we then see this woman walking the streets and she comes upon this guy and he turns around and she hypnotizes him right with that ring and she gets herself another victim so obviously this, this ritualistic cleanse thing hasn't worked. We then get introduced to a psychiatrist named Jeffrey. He's at like some sick hunting club or whatever with <laughs> yeah. his Scottish friend. He's super Scottish, he can barely understand what he's saying. And the secretary pulls up and, we've got another case, you must get back to London. So Von Helsing actually summoned the psychiatrist to his aid and we find out that the psychiatrist Jeffrey used to be a student of Von Helsing and they're quite close. Jeffrey's like, well, I can't get you out of this mess yeah. besides you claiming that you're insane. That's the only way because you admitted to murder. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter what your fucking yeah. story is. While he's in London, he attends this kind of like a high society party. Who shows up is Dracula's daughter, but she's going by the name of Countess Zaleska. Starts talking about his work and how he can relieve people from their addictions and she kind of, oh, he might be able to help me get rid of my addiction to killing and to drinking blood. So they meet privately later. Jeffrey starts to tell her, well, the way you have to battle addiction is to not avoid your temptation, but to actually confront it mm -hmm. and then deny it. So I like, put it right in front of you and then say no. Easier said than done, <laughs> especially when you need blood to live. Countess Seleska tries this out. She puts it to the test and she gets her manservant. <laughs> yeah, Xander. 
that Benicio del Toro guy? <laughs> <laughs> finds this woman who needs money and is cold and mm. needs a place to stay and offers her my mistress needs a model to paint and yeah. you'd make a perfect subject and lures her over and she starts getting undressed and everything and it's kind of a little risque risque right? at the time can't deny the temptation she actually goes in and drinks this woman's blood this woman is found and she's catatonic and they take her to the hospital this is the second victim they found now with the pin pricks on the neck and it's like hmm yeah it kind of sounds a lot like van helsing's story over here so they get jeffrey to hypnotize her to bring her out of this coma and tell them what happened to her and she starts talking about this mysterious dark woman that brought me to her house and wanted to drink my blood. Von Helsing is saying that this should happen. Maybe it's kind of true. <laughs> Dracula's daughter at this point knows that she can't beat this. She can't beat the vampirism. So she's got to accept it and she needs a mate. And she really is taking a liking to the psychiatrist here, Jeffrey. So she kidnaps Jeffrey's secretary takes her back to Transylvania to lure him there <laughs> yeah. so she can turn him into a vampire too. So Jeffrey enlists Basil Humphrey from Scotland Yard and Von Helsing who's now pretty much free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just let him go. To go rescue his secretary Janet from Dracula's daughter. And that's where we're gonna end the plot. So if you want to see how the movie ends keep watching and we might actually spoil it for you later on because yeah it, the movie is like a hundred years old almost <laughs> yeah, so near. if you haven't fucking seen it <laughs> if you haven't seen it watch it now and then come back the first thing that we got to mention about this is how completely different this movie is from the original dracula right this movie takes a complete 180 they don't follow the same formula, the same path that the first one does, right? Take this in a completely new and fresh direction for the time. Sequels weren't really a thing. This is the second Universal sequel, I think. Bride of Frankenstein came out the year before. So there was no kind of cookie cutter sequel thing. Formula. That, formula at the time, which is refreshing. This movie was only five years after the original and how different it is, like how much they've already improved on the craft of filmmaking in five years. Mm -hmm. The original Dracula is a classic. A lot of people love it. It's paced really slow. There's no music. There's no music. Uh, there's not much humor at all. It fills all those gaps that was missing from the original. So this has fantastic music, yeah. which hits you right away. It's like, ah! Yeah. It there's starts. Music. It starts and like, ah, oh, thank God, there's music in this one, and it's that <laughs> classic universal big orchestra music. It's paced really quick, edited really quick. Mm -hmm. There's not much downtime with like dead spots. There's no fluff in the story yeah. either. Like it hits home quick. Everything is poignant in this movie and relates to directly to the story. The dialogue is really snappy and back yeah. and forth, like almost like. British comedy style in a way. Huge difference from the original. Yeah. And it's a breath of fresh air in my opinion. It seems like they were taking a bit of a chance. Kudos to them because they could have and probably maybe they should have followed the same, you know, depending yeah. on, on how much money they wanted to make on it, right? But they wanted to do something new and fresh, so good for them on that. Yeah, like you look at everything about this movie, like we, all the stuff we already mentioned, mm -hmm. plus the fact that Bela Lugosi was not involved whatsoever yeah. in the sequel. The marquee name that Bela Lugosi had at the time. Nah, we don't need him. Yeah. Or he didn't want to do it, one of the two. But either way, it's very interesting that like, even for him to be in the beginning, as a cameo in the casket Something. with a stake in his heart so they could put his name on the credits. Or even in a flashback. They completely shed his name from anything to do with it, which is interesting, especially yeah. for a sequel. And one thing we have to mention too about this movie, which is pretty blatant if you have a brain in your fucking skull, <laughs> is that this movie is just loaded with all sorts of themes, social issues, addiction. The movie's called Dracula's Daughter. So right off the bat, this is about women. This is yeah. about females. This yeah. is no longer about Dracula. 
now we're taking this in a different direction. It's pretty obvious in this movie that they're saying something about females' roles in society. Almost every woman in this movie, on the same level as a man. Yeah, or stronger. Or stronger. Jeffrey's secretary, Janet, she's always putting him in his place. She's driving the car. He doesn't know how to tie a tie. She has to tie it for him. She's like wearing the pants in a way. She pisses him off so much. You're fired. She's like, I already wrote up my resignation. Yeah. Then something happens and he's like, I need you. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it's great that there's a lot of strong women in here that don't take no bullshit from men. In 1936, that's kind of ahead of its time. Dracula's daughter kind of manipulates in death and like the secretary for example manipulates in life. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. sort of It's very that's very yeah. true. Yeah. All the males in this with power, with positions of power, officers, you know, Scotland Yard policemen, they're all idiots. Yeah, bumbling idiots. They're all bumbling idiots and they're and they are the comedic relief which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what this movie is saying about men and women. This movie also has a lot to say about it. addiction, essentially, right? These urges that she has. She has to kill, but she doesn't want to. She hates it. She wants to be rid of these feelings, but she just cannot find a way. And she thinks that the psychiatrist will help her. Mm -hmm. And that's saying something maybe about psychiatrists and like yeah you think this person can help you but they're just trying to tell you how to think a different way yeah it doesn't change you you the way you're made up the way you come out of the womb the way your brain is wired yeah doesn't fucking change there's no quick fix right, right. so basically Zaleska is looking for a quick fix and it just isn't there she's a vampire she needs this to live. Like, yeah. she just can't give up blood and killing or else she will die. You know, people who go to AA will always say, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I'm not recovered, I'm recovering. You'll always be recovering until you die because it's just the way you are. You can't change that. Yeah. You'll yeah. always be addicted to this thing. And the only escape, really, is death. Like, you'll be fighting it the rest, the of, your rest life. of your life. And that's kind of the way the movie ends. Benicio Del Toro. <laughs> Sandor kills her and you don't know if it's a mercy killing or if you don't know mm -hmm. if it's because he's had enough of her shit but that's the only thing that will stop this urge right yeah Jeffrey is forced to choose between his own life and Janet's what are you willing to give up to save somebody yeah. or yourself even it's Aleska's moral debate too her life or others because mm -hmm. she doesn't like killing but she needs to kill to live it's like there's that struggle, yeah, and that's why she seeks help. The comedy in this movie is fantastic, and I like how it doesn't really overshadow the rest of the movie, what's going on, right? It's just in pockets. Police officers that are a little bumbly, right? And the one guy who's sort of new, and he's always jittery and looking around and afraid. It's funny to think how far back that bumbling cop cliche goes. <laughs> it's in this movie, and it goes Pad before <laughs> this movie, too. The dynamic between Jeffrey and Janet, his secretary, phoning him with a crank call. Yeah, prank calling him <laughs> in the 30s. Yeah. And, you know, just giving him the fucking gears. And so he gives her shit. And he's like, don't call back. And then they get a real phone call from somebody from the, from the hospital, literally wanting to call him over for help. And he's like, I thought I told you, and he's all giving the guy shit. And then he gets back at her by getting the operator to call her house every 30 yeah, minutes. Yeah, to keep her away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stuff like that, it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> the comedy in this movie is actually surpasses, I think, the horror in it. Mm -hmm. It's almost more of a comedy <laughs> than a horror in, in some ways. Yeah. And the comedy goes throughout the whole movie, like that whole routine with the tie, like how he can never tie his tie right, it's always crooked all the time. <laughs> yeah. When he calls the guy from Scotland Yard while he's sleeping in bed, that whole scene <laughs> yeah. is like out of a fucking Monty Python sketch. It's just like this witty, 
British dialogue back and forth. It's hilarious. Yeah. Are you going to have your barley water? Barley water? Fetch me my gun. I'm going to hunt vampires. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and because it's a universal movie in the 30s, the sets and the atmosphere are a given. Yeah. Spectacular, full of fog, these great gothic sets. You sink into the couch yep. when you're watching this, and you get all, you hear that music, and you see the fog and the sets, and you're like, mm. you, you kind of feel at home. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and it kind of actually makes you wish that you could live in this time period. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe not forever, but to experience <laughs> it for a bit, like to be all highbrow and go to the parties yeah, and, and get mingle. A, get attacked by a vampire. Yeah, like, like, a lot of critics happen to touch upon the fact that there's this uh, lesbian sort of uh, angle played up in this movie, right? And we didn't, I didn't really see it. Like, I, I can see where they were going with that, but in the context of the whole movie, I did not really see this lesbian angle played out. No, there are definitely scenes where I can see where people could get that impression. When she gets the, the model to take off her clothes and stuff like that, it's a little erotic and it's a little sexual. And when she goes to bite the secretary, Janet, she goes in and it looks like a kiss. Like, mm -hmm. that's you know, very sexual and yeah. alluring and stuff. But it's also just the vampire way of doing things. Vampires are very sexual yeah, and provocative provocative in my opinion it's her prey she bites men in this too but i think it's just that they were choosing to use women push the boundaries a bit to say that dracula's daughter is a lesbian in this i think is far-fetched that's a fucking stretch i think it shows how it manages to put that seed in your mind though right how people yeah. are talking about it and it's like well brilliant filmmaking yeah, it is. And it really, if, if anything, it kind of just maybe implies that she is not a lesbian, but she's maybe just open to whatever. She's more bisexual or whatever. Maybe. At the M most. Maybe at the most. But the fact that at the end, she lures Jeffrey to Transylvania to capture him and to turn him into a vampire to be her eternal partner. Mm -hmm. Well, that tells me she's not necessarily a lesbian because she wants an eternal male partner. Yeah. I think it was, they were just doing some provocative filmmaking at the time. Yep. You know, like, yep. the, let's push the boundaries a bit. We're pushing the boundaries as far as social issues go in this movie, as far as women and men and women's rights and stuff like that. So let's, let's yep. do it, you know, on screen as much as we could. And I think that's what those scenes are really doing. It's great that we can have this conversation about this movie all these years later and debate that. I think that's super cool that a movie that's this old, we can talk about these kind of themes yeah. and that they're, they're even touching on them is pretty cool. Yeah, there's. I love how there's all that kind of innuendo -y yeah. stuff put into this movie. And yeah, you're still debating it. And it's like, I think it's a, I think this is a brilliant movie. A really cool sequel because it took everything and flipped it on its ass, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is what you kind of want from a sequel. I wish more sequels would learn from what this movie did and not just repeat what came before. Yeah, exactly. No cookie cutter shit, right? Do your own thing. So that's it. So if you want a very smart, very provocative, very thought inducing movie, then check out 1936's Dracula's Daughter. Uh, you'll definitely have a debate of some kind going on, right? Yeah. And watch it with somebody so you can talk about what this movie is trying to get yeah. across. Yeah, because maybe you'll have a different opinion than us, right? Yeah. It's perfectly fine. And for sure you'll have a laugh because the movie's legitimately funny. <laughs> yeah. If anyone is one of those people that says, I won't watch a movie because it's old and black and white, well, then you can fuck off. <laughs> and until next time, keep drinking.